We have with us today Timothy Ogden. Timothy is uh, Managing Director of the Financial Access Initiative and the Senior Fellow of the Aspen Institute's Economic Opportunities Program and Financial Security Program. Uh, Tim was uh, Managing Director of the U.S. Financial Diaries Project, I'm sure you're familiar with it, which tracked the financial lives of 235 U.S. households for a full year. Uh, Tim has uh, developed and edited more than 20 books, including Experimental Conversations, Perspective on Randomized Trials in Development Economics, and is currently working on two important books, Financial Inclusion, What Everyone Needs to Know, and automated conversations, uh, perspective on artificial intelligence uh, and uh, big data uh, in economics. So I would like to invite Tim. Tim has kindly offered to to um, provide uh, the keynote speech uh, for this conference. So Tim, the floor is yours. And there we are. Thank you very much, Egor. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, this is my first time in Istanbul, uh, and I have enjoyed it immensely. My son, Nathaniel, 13, uh, came with me to uh, learn a little bit about the rest of the world. So um, I'm going to judge how well I do by whether he stays awake uh, during the presentation. Uh, as Egor said, I am the Managing Director of the Financial Access Initiative at NYU Wagner. We are a research center focused on financial services for low-income households. And I've been doing that for, I can't remember how long, eight years or so. Uh, but it's interesting to me the things that I spend my time talking about now because uh, around the time when Nathaniel was born, um, I spent most of my time running around telling people that the evidence that microcredit had an impact on poverty simply wasn't there. Uh, we were hearing lots of claims about how microcredit was going to reduce or eliminate poverty, and we didn't have evidence to back it up. Now, 13 years later, I spend most of my time trying to convince people that actually, despite what you've heard from some of these RCTs, there is evidence of the importance of microcredit and microfinance in general. So uh, I've come on through a very long journey over the last 13 years, and I want to walk you through uh, some of that and how I got there, where I started from and where I am now. So the title of the talk is why I believe, in fact, and have written extensively over the last three years, that there is a strong case for additional investment in microcredit and in microfinance. This is a picture of um, uh, my old presentation. Um, so we are going to uh, embark on a bit of an adventure here because I'm not sure what's uh, on these slides. Um, this is a current picture from the Global Findex of financial inclusion. So um, when I came into this space, the estimates were that about uh, half the world was unbanked. And over the course of the last few years, we've managed to reduce that number probably by half somewhere around a third of the world left is unbanked. That's a lot of progress in a very small amount of time. When you consider that it took us several millennia to get from 0% banked to 50% banked, and then uh, about 15 years to get from 50 to 70% banked. That's not a small thing because the process of getting people formal financial services has been going on for millennia. That slide looks a little bit more familiar, so maybe we're a little bit better off than I thought. So let's talk about, think about, what is the evidence for financial inclusion? How should we think about why financial inclusion matters? There's a bunch of different ways we can apply ideas and evidence to figure out how much this matters. Theory. I spend most of my time hanging out with economists, and the most important thing to know about economists is uh, anytime you're talking to economists, you'll hear somewhere along the way someone saying, uh, I don't care about your data, what's your theory? That's how economists think. So the theory 
uh, is something economists have been working on since Adam Smith and the famous uh, uh, economist of the 1800s and the 1700s, thinking about why does access to finance matter? How does it drive an economy? We can look at history to see how has financial services affected the economic development and growth of countries uh, as it was developed. We've got several hundred years of history in the United States and Europe and Asia of uh, how financial services have been used and played a part in economic development. We can look at what we call macro empirics. So we've got data on the relative financial system development in all sorts of different countries, and we can compare what happens in those countries to each other. And we have more recently impact evaluations. This is a more recent development that we figured out how to reliably measure the impact of a change to what is available to people. What happens when people get access to credit? What happens when people get access to savings? So if we look at this evidence combined, from theory, the evidence is very clear. Financial services matter. If you can't accumulate the capital to invest, you can't invest, it's that simple. From a theoretical perspective, we have no questions about how important financial system development is, how important access to microfinance is. From a historical perspective, we can look at the development of any nation around the world and see a clear pattern that the more developed the financial system is, the more people have access to finance in a country, the faster that country grows. And just quickly, the best evidence, uh, anecdotally for this, just to sort of understand how this works, is the major factor in the, the change in development in the world so far has been the Industrial Revolution. Every technology that was involved in the Industrial Revolution was invented about 80 years before it became a, a driver of growth. The gap between invention of technology and what happened to growth is about the development of the financial system. Because just because you had a steam engine doesn't mean you had the capital to build them and deploy them. So in every case, the technology comes first, the banks come second, growth comes third. We can see that in all sorts of historical examples. We can look at macro empirics. We can compare countries of data from the last 20 years, and we see that, yes, absolutely, financial system development, access to the number of people in the country of access to formal services, is uh, directly correlated with the growth rates um, and even the levels of inequality in that country. Financial system development is strongly associated with reduced inequality. In any country where lots of people don't have access to finance, only the people at the top have the capital to invest. And when only the people at the top of the capital invest, what you get is more inequality. The more developed the financial system, you have a reduction of inequality. Of course, we get to impact evaluations, and I'm sure that all of you know this, is that, so we, we have theory, we know that it's important. We have history, we know that it's important. We have macro that we know that it's important. Then we go and try and measure it, and we find that, in fact, we can't find any effect of delivering financial services. It's strange. It's a bit of a mystery. And so uh, what I want to spend most of my time today talking about is how can we make sense of this mystery when theory, history, empirics tell us this matters, impact evaluations tell us we can't see an impact. This, by the way, is just a quick chart of the randomized controlled trials of access to credit from around the world. There have been a lot of these studies. And so I want to say, uh, first of all, that I'm not saying that you should not believe these studies. These studies are reliable. What they are telling us is true. The question is why can't we see it, not what's wrong with the studies. But in general, what these studies have shown is that we provide people additional access to credit, we significantly increase access to credit, and we can't find meaningful changes in income, we can't find meaningful changes in profits, we can't find meaningful changes in consumption, we can't find meaningful changes in women's empowerment, all of the things that we thought microcredit was doing, we don't see significant changes. So again, the question is not, this is wrong and why, it's why are we seeing these results? Now along the way, when these impact evaluations, these RCTs have been getting a lot of attention, there's been another stream of research that I have been lucky enough to be involved in called Financial Diaries. Many of you may be aware of a book called Portfolios of the Poor, that tracks the financial lives of households in Bangladesh, India, and South Africa for a year. 
And we learned some very, very important things from that research in understanding how people living on, at the time, under $2 a day, how do they actually do that? What do their financial lives actually look like? And that research was so influential that we got funding to actually do it for the United States because a number of funders just determined that we now knew more about the lives of low-income households in developing countries than we knew about those same households in developed countries. Now, these are two charts of two different households. One is in the United States, one is in South Africa. They don't look very different, do they? Anybody here want to guess which family is which? And let me just explain this chart for you quickly. So the dotted line here, this line, this is their average income for the year. And the line going up and down is their actual measured income and expenses. In this case, this is the net cash flow, income minus expenses. Up here we have it broken out, you know, income and expenses. Anybody want to guess which one is from the United States and which one is from South Africa? Right, I mean there's nothing there I would tell you, right? What we've learned about the lives of low-income households is they don't operate the way we, we thought they did. There is not any underlying steadiness. There's volatility, there's ups and downs, there's a whole lot of complication. And just in case you're wondering, the, this is a, the family from Ohio in the United States. This is a woman named Pumza who uh, is a market stall vendor in South Africa. But the reality is, Low-income households, no matter where they are, have extreme difficulty figuring out how to tie their finances together because there is very little steadiness and an enormous amount of volatility. Volatility of income, volatility of expenses. This is a very difficult thing to manage. Thankfully, I work at a research institute where we are surrounded by uh, very intelligent scholars who developed a, uh, a way for the average household to figure out how to manage their funds. All they have to do is solve this equation, right? I actually have no idea what that equation is for, but that's how complicated things really are. If you think about a household who has that level of volatility, that level of uncertainty between their income and expenses, and trying to figure out how do I decide when the right time to invest is? How do I figure out what the right investment is? Which, which machine do I invest in? Which industry do I get into? Should I continue sort of my market stall or should I buy some sort of uh, a car so I can start a transportation business? Should I uh, get into textiles? These are not easy questions to answer, and even for all those of us who spend all of our time thinking, like, this, solving these equations would be relatively impossible. What the households end up doing then is they develop these very uh, complex systems um, to figure out how to make ends meet. This, in case uh, you can't see from the back, is a way of changing, uh, of turning on the television uh, by the inducement of a rabbit uh, hopping for a carrot to operate a machine. But these are the, that was exciting. Uh, we can get that cleaned up later. I'm gonna get that back in my belt. There we are. Uh, I think I'm gonna use this diagram over here to explain this, but this just is an illustration, a theoretical illustration of the financial lives of households. Right? What we did when we introduced microcredit is we said, oh, people don't have access to credit. Let's make the carrot bigger. There's a carrot here. They will uh, fly up and land here. The rabbit will jump out and it'll eat the carrot. It'll press the button. It'll change the, uh, it'll turn on the television. If we don't understand the whole system, we can see, oh, if we make the carrot bigger, that's gonna, be, that's gonna make things work better. But once we have a picture of the whole system, you can see making the carrot bigger is just not gonna really do anything. The system is too complex uh, in the way it fits together for us to make one small change in access to credit and expect it's going to have these large impacts. So many of you may be familiar with uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs from psychology. It's an idea that well, we all have as human beings a set of needs and that um, they stack on top of each other. Your most basic need is physical well-being and safety. And if you don't have that, you can't fulfill a need higher. So you've got to meet needs as you go 
uh, and at the top is the idea of self-actualization. We can't become our best selves if we haven't taken care of our, uh, our lower needs, safety, uh, uh, housing, uh, self-esteem, sort of those things. So let's think about a hierarchy of needs of what households and firms, you know, the small firms that we, we think about when we talk about microfinance, what are their hierarchy of financial needs? The most basic need of low-income households and small firms is to manage liquidity, right? In the face of extreme volatility and uncertainty, the biggest problem is making sure that you have the money that you need in cash when you need it. And that is a very difficult thing confronted with a lot of volatility and ups and downs to make sure you've got the money in the right place. If you cannot manage liquidity, then you cannot do anything else. If you can't get the cash you need on a regular basis on the day that you need it, you need to buy food today, you need to pay a vendor tomorrow, you need to pay employees the next day, and you're not sure when the income is coming in, if you can't do that, you can't do anything else. You're not going to grow, you're not going to have much of that. Once you can manage liquidity, then you can start thinking about managing investment. But of course, if you're tying up all of your money trying to manage liquidity, then you can't accumulate the capital necessary to make an investment. So you have to have some stability in your liquidity, and then you need to have a tool to accumulate that capital to make an investment. When you can manage investment, then you can turn to managing risk. Now, it's shaped this way because somehow, uh, some of your customers, I know, some of your clients know, care more about risk than they care about investment. That's just a fact of, of human nature. Some people are more worried about the downside than the upside. But for the most part, people tend to worry about uh, they must manage liquidity, then they think about investing in the future, and then they think about protecting what they've got from downsides. This is the way that we need to be thinking about what we are delivering to customers. The big problem we had in our mental model of microfinance was that what people needed was the ability to manage investment. And we didn't address their need to manage liquidity. So when we even decided what microcredit was supposed to be doing, it wasn't to manage liquidity, it was to, for people to invest and grow. But of course, our clients are much smarter than we are, right? And they took the tool that was made available to them and they applied it to what they needed, not what we wanted. And the fact is, if you think about it in terms of managing liquidity, any of the products that we develop can be applied to any of most of those needs. So if your need is to manage liquidity, you can do that with a payments product, you can do that with a credit product, you can do that with a savings product. And what we see over and over again when we sort of delve into the details of impact evaluations of credit and savings, is what we see is that the, the, the need that people applied their access to was not investment, it was liquidity. And when you apply one of these products to liquidity, you're going to get just sort of a different situation. You're not going to see large investment gains because that's not what people did with the money. That wasn't the need. <laughs> Many of these products can be used to manage investment, but only after we've helped the clients meet the need of managing liquidity. Many of these same products can then be applied to help them manage risk, but only after we've helped them meet these lower level needs. Now along the way, because economists are never satisfied, I think many people have the impression that uh, some of these economists who run randomized control trials, they did these trials in microcredit, they didn't find meaningful impacts on poverty, and they packed up their bags and went home and propped up their feet and had a nice cup of tea. It's just not the way economists work. As soon as they get these results, even before they get these results, there's a, a hundred other studies trying to launch and trying to understand, wait, how is it possible that we take these low-income households, we get them this low-cost credit, and then we don't see? So they were as confused as everybody else as to what the results were, and so we launched a whole bunch of other studies to try and find out, like, what is in fact going on? Some of those are the financial diary studies that I, I uh, refer to, but even more specifically, there's a whole bunch of additional research since those RCTs on how microcredit and re other uh, related microfinance products are actually being used. What are people doing? And so what we have learned from 
the rest of that research that has happened since those microcredit RCTs is, um, first of all, this infrastructure for inclusion. This is that chart that came up first that surprised me. But basically, what microfinance has accomplished is that it has radically increased the number of people who have access to financial formal services. And it has done so at very, very low cost. Now, I want to take a moment here to talk about subsidy. Because a lot of the rhetoric of the microfinance movement has always been, uh, from at least some certain wing of the microfinance movement, subsidy is not necessary. The importance of microfinance is that you can uh, accomplish these goals without significant subsidy. The reason we got this change in, in financial inclusion is not without subsidy. Absolutely, there was an enormous amount of subsidy into this industry. And there was a reason for that, which we'll keep talking about for the rest of the presentation. But uh, even today, uh, the majority of microfinance institutions around the world, no matter how big, no matter how old, receive subsidy. At the same time, the average subsidy is less than $10 per loan. And if I had come to a conference of development ministers, in 1985 and said that for less than $10 per person, I can include a third of the world in formal financial services. No one would have believed me. I would have been laughed out of the room. That is among the cheapest development interventions in the history of the world. $10 per person to bring someone into the formal financial services system. We should all be enormously proud of what has been accomplished, that we have built an industry that can reach that many people that reliably for that small amount of money. There is no other intervention that you can think of. I should probably stop swinging my arms like that, huh? No other intervention that you can think of could possibly accomplish that much for that little money. We should stop talking about no subsidy and start talking about value for money because no other intervention can compete with the value for money in those terms. Second, we've learned that we created a very, very valuable liquidity management product for people. Microcredit is an incredibly valuable uh, liquidity management product. How do we know? Because the customers keep coming back, right? When we look at something like the portfolios of the poor research, and this is an example family from Bangladesh, the number of financial services that any of these families already use, whether formal or informal, is enormous. So our original mental model around microcredit is people have no access to credit. What it turns out is people had access to credit all over the place. They, it just wasn't formal. And then we added some small formal version. Now it turns out that people prefer that, that formal version for the most part. They like having a tool that is reliable, that it follows rules, that you know, when you need a loan, it doesn't involve visiting your mother-in-law and spending four hours drinking tea uh, before you sort of find a way to ask politely for a little bit of money, and then your mother-in-law harasses you every day for the next six years, right? Microfinance is great compared to that. People like it, they use it, it accomplishes a goal, it's just not the goal that we thought it was. But this other very interesting thing that we've been learning is that one of the reasons we don't see impact from microcredit is not just that it's primarily being channeled into managing liquidity, is because microcredit where it um, uh, penetrates has substantial effects on labor markets. So in some of the comments we heard earlier today about microcredit being a role for bringing people out of unemployment and into some form of formal employment, uh, this is a really crucial thing. And we see that by people who did not have access to capital starting their own businesses. Those people otherwise would have been engaged in what, uh, what we call casual labor. So we pull them out of one labor market, them trying to find uh, some, something to do for the day, some way to get paid, and into some other form of employment. What that does is it reduces the number of people engaged in casual employment, and wages go up for the people who didn't take the loan, who didn't start their business. And so rather than seeing zero effect, what we see is that microcredit in many places like uh, India has raised wages for everyone. 
Now, the way we designed the microcredit studies, we were looking to see what happened to these people versus these people. If your intervention raises wages for everybody, and you look at the end, it says, well, you didn't, nothing happened by the design of those studies. We've done further studies that realize that can show that actually it was this intervention that raised the level for everyone. There is an impact there, it just does, it isn't the difference between the control and the treatment. And we're seeing that in more and more places, is that microcredit has this effect of changing the market. Another recent study in Kenya found uh, that it was making loans for grain storage technology for farmers, because the big problem for farmers is the same time that you harvest is the same time that everyone else is harvesting. So at harvest, prices plummet. And then six months later, prices go way back up. That's, that's been the problem for farmers for, what, uh, 50,000 years or so? So they made these loans to farmers to store grain so they didn't have to sell it at harvest. And those farmers hold back some of their grain and they sell it progressively over the years. Now the fact that these farmers who got the loans were able to do that changes the market for grain across the board. So prices don't fall as much at harvest. So even the farmers who don't have the grain storage technology, the loan, their incomes go up because the price of grain is higher. Six months later, when the farmers with the grain storage start selling their grain, that brings prices back down, which benefits everybody because the cost of food isn't as high. And this study estimated that 70% of the gains from the microcredit intervention went to people who didn't get the loans. That's what we're seeing more and more from our microcredit studies, trying to understand why we're not seeing any impact. I don't know if this picture means anything to anybody. Uh, this is, I don't know either. This is a, a result of a search. This is apparently the, uh, this, the crew of uh, a show called Dragon's Den uh, in the UK. It's a, it's a business plan competition where you go and you present your business idea to a bunch of venture capital investors and they decide whether to invest in your company or not. This other important thing that we've been learning is that microcredit does have a very large impact for a very small number of clients. And I'm sure you'll recognize this, that there are those clients that you have that really do want to be entrepreneurs. They really do want to start a growing business. They have goals and aims to get much bigger over time. That's not the majority of clients. Most clients are what I refer to as frustrated employees. They, they want a job, there are no jobs, so they take a loan to create a job for themselves. If you are a frustrated employee, you are not going to do all of the things that are required to make a rapidly growing business. That's not what you got into business for. You got into business to create an income for yourself. We should not be surprised that people who don't want to grow their businesses don't grow their businesses. But there are people who do very much want to grow their businesses. And when those people get access to microcredit, their businesses do grow substantially. It's just that they're a small part of the overall field. Now for those of you or some of you thinking ahead, there's this question of can we get more loans to the people who want to grow and less loans to the people who don't? But we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But this is where the state of the research is in microcredit now. We know that it's an incredibly cheap way to vastly expand inclusion. We know that it's a very valuable liquidity management tool for many, many households. We know that it has these effects on labor markets and other markets that benefit whole communities. And we know that there's some small portion of entrepreneurs who are, can rapidly grow, want to, and benefit a lot from access to credit. All good news, but let's take a deep breath and pause. There are some warning signs. And here, the theme of the conference is demystifying digital. And uh, Zhegorz mentioned my, um, my newsletter. And in the newsletter, if you read my newsletter, you can see that often there is uh, some very skeptical questions about digital finance. And that's what I want to talk about, why I tend to be skeptical about digital, which is not to say that I don't think there's value in digital, but I do see that often the way that digital is thought about is similar to the wrong mental models that we thought about microcredit. So just as a, a way of introducing this, the 
the thing that, that got everybody excited originally about digital finance was M-Pesa and the ability to do mobile money, mobile payments, right? So I want to ask you, how does a product that helps people spend more money make people less poor? I, I don't know. And it's curious to me that people got so excited about the impact, the anti-poverty impact, of a payments platform. Payments are an absolutely necessary thing, they're helpful, but it's not clear how we have a poverty impact by increasing the ability of people to spend. Unless you start to think really, really hard, and it's there, we'll get there too. But, Overall, when we talk about digital finance, the big question is, who is providing it for what purpose? So I want to talk some about microfinance history. Because I think the best way to think about what's going to happen in terms of digital finance and what is required from those of us who care about outcomes for poor households to make digital finance a reality that does help people is by looking back at the history of technology and microfinance. What has happened? How has microfinance worked? And so I want to start, these are our two books. I sit in an academic institution, so I still spend a lot of time with books. Um, this book on the left, called 10,000 Small Loans, was written in 1910 about microfinance in the United States. The, book, the other book, The City of Debtors, is about attempts to regulate microfinance in the United States going back to the 1890s. Microfinance, when we think about the modern microfinance movement, many of the people hear the word microfinance and they think something like Muhammad Yunus 1980. Microfinance is much, much older than that. And it comes back to those core needs we've talked about. Managing liquidity has always been an important financial need. So there have always been people trying to provide products to do that. Now, some of you uh, may say, well, the United States is all well and good, but uh, what about Europe? Well, it turns out microfinance, the microfinance revolution came to, Europe, to France in the 1600s, uh, in the, sorry, in the 18, early 1800s. In this book, Dark Matic Credit, is the story of microcredit in France in the 1800s that managed to motivate more capital in France than the mortgage industry, the formal mortgage industry, until after World War II. The primary way that property was acquired in France until about 1950 was through what, for all intents and purposes, was uh, community-based microcredit lending. But I'm sure I have, uh, some of you have some German friends who would want to say, well, those French, they didn't come along to it until the 1800s. Uh, Schultz de Lies invented this in Germany in the 1700s. About 1801 was when he launched his first credit cooperative bank. So we have several hundred years of history. Um, but then uh, my Irish friends would say, uh, Jonathan Swift invented group lending in the 1600s in Ireland. But then some of uh, my friends here from Istanbul might point out that Hammurabi had a code for the regulation of small finance about 6,000 years ago. This challenge that we have of figuring out how to deliver formal financial services to low-income households is not a new challenge. We did not recognize this in 1980 for the first time. Microcredit, there's nothing that is happening now in microcredit that is new from a historical perspective. These have always been problems. It is incredibly difficult to figure out how to provide formal financial services to low-income households experiencing a lot of volatility. It always has been. So one message I certainly want you to walk away from here, it, if you're feeling like, man, it is really hard to run an MFI today, know that you are dealing with the same problems that people have been struggling with for thousands of years. It is no failing to say that this is hard because it's always been hard. But I can tell you that without institutions, like those represented in this room, institutions that are founded on the idea of actually helping lower income households and small businesses, 
we know what happens. Because all of these historical things that I've mentioned all ended in tears at some point. Because banks fail, these are difficult customers to serve, and people who don't care about outcomes come along and they exploit. My, my number one prediction for digital finance around the world is what digital finance is going to do is it's going to make more of the world look like the United States. And if you don't know anything about the financial system in the United States, that is a bad thing. That is not a hopeful story. In the United States, still, somewhere between 10 and 15% of the population is, uh, is unbanked in any meaningful way. In the United States, we have more uh, high-cost payday lenders than McDonald's and Starbucks combined. In the United States, no one really has access has a problem getting any access to credit. They have access getting access to they have a problem getting access to affordable credit. And many of the people who are excluded, women, minorities, people outside of major cities still struggle to find access to credit, to build jobs, to build wealth. And that is because there is a whole industry of digitally enabled companies that will make high cost loans to those people and extract as much money from them as possible as quickly as possible. People who do not care at all about the outcomes for those households. The dilemma of exclusion, the dilemma that we have to confront as an industry is the Groucho Marx problem. Groucho Marx is famous for saying something along the lines of, I would not want to belong to any club that would have me as a member. And this is the story of these low-income households, is that serving them well is hard and expensive. It's more expensive and harder to serve these clients than it is to serve wealthier clients. So without a pro poor mandate, Financial services firms serve higher income clients. They abandon their low income clients because they are less profitable. If you get only profit driven, there's no reason to serve the bottom end of the pyramid. It is uh, uh, higher cost transactions, more risk, and that is just a fact. This chart is from the US Financial Diaries, and it's just illustrating here that if you have a steady income, you're going to have a lot of access to financial services because people want to help you. They can, they can evaluate the risk. They know that you're going to transact. They can predict things. They can predict their profit. That's a useful business opportunity. You're going to get served. If you have an unsteady and volatile income, people aren't going to want to provide services to you because you're risky. You don't know when you're going to have money. They don't know when you're going to have money. So they're going to charge more to make up for that. The critical part of the microfinance industry is it is serving people who would not be served otherwise. And as I said, we see more and more of this evidence that it does matter. The more we build financial systems, the more people we include, we reduce inequality, we can raise whole communities. Now, does that mean that digital finance doesn't matter at all? Absolutely not. Right? One of the core challenges we have is the cost of serving these customers. And if we apply digital finance tools, we can drive down those costs. We can serve those customers better. We can get more information from them. We can help them see patterns in their income. We can start to understand their needs better. We can develop better products. But we can't abandon the digital finance space to the telecom companies who don't care about poor outcomes. All they care about is maximizing the number of transactions that they get to charge a percentage on. We can't abandon small dollar credit to FinTech who doesn't care about uh, outcomes for poor customers or excluded customers. We have to figure out how to apply those tools within the frameworks that we've developed with a purpose of elevating these communities. So where do we go from here? George, I'm okay on time? Uh, where do we go from here? We have built an incredible infrastructure for innovation. 
the number of people here, right? All of you are laboratories for innovation in microfinance. If we continue on this path and use these institutions that we've created, we have the opportunity to create innovation, improve the quality of what we do, improve our impact. We need to develop better products for managing liquidity. Credit is not necessarily the best way to help people manage liquidity. We need to find better ways of using the tools available to us to help people manage liquidity with the idea of what we're doing is helping people manage liquidity, not making them repurpose a product nominally for investment. Absolutely, we need to find better ways of managing risk and helping our customers manage risk. Insurance is very, very hard. It's even harder than credit. So we need to find better ways of using the tools that we have to help people manage risk. We should be thinking about ways to identify those entrepreneurs who really want to grow and making sure that we're serving those customers without leaving behind all of the other customers who, uh, frankly, are responsible for a lot of the profit. We need to think about how we help those people who are not entrepreneurs who really want to grow raise their aspirations. And there's a lot of encouraging research about how we can help people uh, raise their aspirations for what they want to accomplish, and when their aspirations rise, they invest more, they grow more. That a problem is not just that they don't know what to do, it's a problem that they don't believe that what they do matters. They don't see a, a hopeful future. How can we help them see a hopeful future and invest? And how can we help them run their businesses better? I'm sure all of you know this, that many of the businesses that we're serving, there are obvious ways that they could be run better that they can increase their own profitability and growth? How do we effectively deliver business training to them so that they can grow more? And that's back to our agenda, that is the end. So um, I hope uh, this has been a useful tour through the history and evidence of microfinance and hopefully uh, raised your aspirations some for what we can accomplish with microfinance. Thank you so much, Dean, thank you. We have any three questions. Could we spare another five minutes, maybe, for Tim to be able to answer, to address these questions? I think that would be great. Tim, I actually have one reflection on your speech. On the, on the future slide, you didn't mention technology as one of the items. Does it mean that uh, you don't see this as something that's purpose in itself? So, uh, I never believe that technology has a purpose in itself. Right? Technology is only as useful as the application to what it is put to. When I talk to MFIs around the world, my biggest concern is that the funders do not appreciate how much digital technology costs. And MFIs are often stuck in this place of uh, we don't have the capital ourselves to invest in digital innovations, and our funders think that digital is cheap. And digital is very expensive. Um, it requires not only capital investment, but it requires a lot of investment in people and training and knowledge, and that doesn't go away. It has to sort of keep going. Um, and so uh, my, my primary message around digital technology is uh, to the people who uh, provide capital to microfinance institutions, you need to provide more for digital. Super. Let's maybe um, try to answer these three questions, if you if you okay staying those extra few minutes. So. The first one is, is microfinance contributing to financial health? And what about the dangers of microfinancing or indebtedness? Um, so financial health is a difficult question to answer without a, a, a holistic view of what's happening in the household. And it, it's a hard to gather that data to really measure what's going on because we know these households have those complex systems, that funny little uh, cartoon that I put up. Um, and without seeing how all of the pieces fit together, it's very difficult to make a judgment as to what is happening and what is increasing uh, or, uh, um, or decreasing financial health. That being said, the more tools that people have, I think we can be reasonably comfortable that the more tools, the more reliable tools, the more formal tools, the more rules-based tools that people have for addressing their financial needs, that's going to give them more choices. And when they have more choices, most of the, the clients are smart. They're going to generate better outcomes when they have better tools and more choices. Over-indebtedness is absolutely a problem, but it's a problem for the banks 
as much as it is for, like the, for the, the, the clients. And so uh, I have not seen a situation of serious over indebtedness problem that hasn't been generated by the banks lowering their thresholds for their own sustainability. When banks get out in front, and as we saw in the global financial crisis, when banks stop caring whether people can repay, bad things happen. And that's, just, that's not just a problem with microfinance, that's a problem with finance. So as long as we are responsibly lending, as long as we are uh, operating according to a pro for mandate, and we are actually concerned about the outcomes for people, I don't tend to worry a whole lot about my over -indebted. Super. So we have um, another question. Is the comparative measure of the contribution of uh, MFIs uh, in basic savings accounts in progress in financial structures worldwide? Yeah. Um, so there's a recent uh, uh, review of evidence um, from uh, the Campbell Collaborative that has come to the conclusion that there's better evidence for savings impact than there is for credit impact uh, that I tend to disagree with. Um, I disagree with it because um, there's not an economic model for savings. So most MFIs have a very difficult time offering a significant amount of savings products because savings is much more expensive to offer than credit. It's a lot less profitable. And while it's true that by and large people will likely gain from access to a savings account more than they will from credit, we can't ignore the side of like, how are we going to get them access to savings accounts? We have to have some business model to deliver the product. So uh, in some ways I see savings accounts similar as the best thing we could possibly do to alleviate poverty is to give people money, right? Just give them the money. But then you run out of money pretty quickly. So if we want to do something that's going to, that's going to have a business model so we can serve millions and millions of clients, we have to have a business model. Credit has a business model. The business model of savings is still very much in question. Okay. Super. And the last question, interest spreads, different between interest on loans and interest paid on deposits on a positive trend in LDCs, less developed countries, but doesn't translate into economic growth. Why? Um, if I knew the answer to that, I would not be here. I would be on my yacht in the bus course. Uh, <laughs> but um, it is always very difficult to take a question of what we are doing on a micro level and then understand how that translates to the macro level. When I talked about the household's complex systems, we have to take into account that the economy's complex systems are even much more complicated than that. Um, I think the major question on growth globally right now is about how automation is affecting productivity and which jobs are going away. And I think the major question in growth ha actually has to do with macroeconomic uh, issues of uh, productivity growth and what kinds of jobs there are, um, not with the not with the, the internals of the financial system, it's more macroeconomic factors. Um, that being said, I think that is an incredibly encouraging trend, and sometimes the issue is there's just an, uh, too much of a lag between we see uh, economic fact X, it takes sometimes three, five years for that uh, to trickle through because there is more investment, but that those investments don't pay off right away, they pay off over three to five years, and that's where we start seeing really the impact. And so. Uh, some of that, I think, is, is the lag. Some of it, I think, is sort of global economic issues that have more to do with uh, automation and technology and jobs, and they do have to do with financial systems. Super. Okay, good. Let's thank Tim for his inspiring speech.